Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Um, is Arnett's network architect, Mr. David Wald, and he'll be presenting on the topic software defined networking. Yeah, thanks very much, Warren. Uh, in fact, I'll be talking particularly about uh, what Arnett's doing in the area of software defined networking, and that's primarily at the moment our software defined networking testbed, the SDN testbed. Um, I guess this, uh, this is one of the, the part of the building blocks that, that Arnet works on. So um, Arnet, from its its early beginnings of bringing the internet to Australia, has, has expanded in, in our network reach and capacity and also the activities that we do. Um, some of you might have seen this slide before already. Uh, it covers a, a fairly broad range of activities. Um, uh, as a network architect, I'm always happy to see network architecture at the very top of this diagram, although that wasn't me to put it there. But you'll see in the uh, if you go around uh, our summary of, of activities that we work on, there's video conferencing, there's peering, there's a cloud store and box, cloud services and such like. And uh, up in the top right, you'll see advanced networking. So one of the aims that we have is to um, put in place the tools for researchers and uh, teaching and learning to be able to advance um, the technology of networking itself as well as, more and more, uh, ourselves spend some time working in that area to, to try to push back the frontiers of, of what networking and the internet can possibly be. Um, I thought I'd give a little bit of a background uh, as to, to why in particular we at Arnet are interested um, in software-defined networking. And I should say at the outset, SDN can mean many different things to many different people and organisations. Um, if you talk to some of the big uh, network vendors, often it's it's more along the lines of orchestration uh, and provisioning of services through a, a single interface. What I'm talking about here when I talk about SDN in the context of our testbed is mainly uh, grassroots, bottom-up, open flow um, development, really changing the, the paradigm of, of Ethernet switches and IP routers to, to be managed in a different way um, from the bottom-up. And that's simply because that's the area that, uh, that researchers across Australia and the world are, are most interested in, um, whereas the, the vendors in many cases are, are coming from a top-down approach. But uh, So keep in mind that when I talk about SDN today, it's primarily talking about open flow and, uh, and similar technologies. Um, so why are we at Arnet interested in uh, software-defined networking? Um, if I were to, to rewind <laughs> maybe 20 years or so, this is what our network looked like. It was um, a very simple network, and you can see the bandwidths were, were minuscule compared to today. Um, we are doing a bit to help the Pacific with a mighty 2.4 kilobits per second into Fiji. Um, and, and this was essentially for many years the uh, Australia's connection to the internet. If you fast forward now, uh, back to uh, around now, our network has obviously changed enormously. Um, the red lines that you can see from from Perth or even the Murchison Regional Observatory right the way through to the east coast up to Brisbane, those are all our own optical transmission network. Um, and overlaid on top of that, the, the dots tend to be uh, backbone routers. So we've got 100 gig routers um, connecting to each other across our uh, underlying optical network. Um, and then extending out from that, the purple lines are uh, uh, 10 gig lease capacity or services which, uh, which extend out to uh, places like Hobart, Fine Arts, Queensland and Darwin. So the, the network has increased in complexity enormously. And historically, we've, um, and to date, we use fairly traditional networking technologies to do this. Um, we run uh, the underlying optical network is Cisco, ONS, uh, family of, of networking gear and we keep it as simple as possible, um, shipping 10 gig and 100 gig wavelengths around the country. Sitting on top of that we've got Juniper MX routers, routers running a, uh, an MPLS based backbone um, and extending services such as, as routed access, so internet and RNA access, um, out to our customers. Um, and, and all of that's fairly traditional. Um, what we're trying to put ourselves in the position uh, of and also our researchers and teaching and learning uh, customers is um, is what will the internet look like in another five years or 10 years or 15 years? And so um, so by dipping the toe into the water of SDN, we're, we're looking to to explore what, what that might look like, what the, the successor to, for instance, MPLS-based networks might look like. 
um, because we run a big one and uh, and so we have a, a strong interest in, in seeing how that could be made more efficient or more flexible. Um, and internationally, uh, the, the complexity only increases. So we have connectivity primarily to the United States. Those two green lines are 40 gig uh, capacity for research and education traffic across the Southern Cross Cable Network. And they land in the West Coast of the United States. And similarly, we have links to Singapore, two and a half gigs. Um, and we interconnect with uh, all those red dotted lines, which are research and education networks uh, internationally. So RNET is Australia's research and education network, but every developed country pretty much around the world uh, and many developing countries have their own research and education networks. We peer with them uh, so that uh, traffic going from a university in Australia to an equivalent institution in the States or in Europe or elsewhere around the world typically traverses just these research and education networks. What that means is um, that there's uh, the flexibility for us to work together and collaborate together and explore what networking might look like going into the future. So some examples of the, the organisations that we work with, um, at RIANS is the New Zealand Research Education Network, we have a close relationship with them, Internet2 and ESNet in the United States both are, are very advanced in many ways. Um, Géant over in Europe, which is the pan-European network, um, we, we work closely with these organisations and, you, and you'll notice on this diagram I've left off any of the, the traditional uh, commercial or commodity internet providers simply because for research and education traffic uh, it doesn't touch any of them uh, in, a, in a routed sense. So um, we, we in the context of the global RNA community, uh, are really interested in, in, in seeing where networking can go and will go. Um, I guess bringing it back home, the, the reason we do all of this is to, is to run services. Um, uh, as simple as the, the, the uh, RNET mirror, which many of you, if you're working in the Linux area, um, would, would be familiar with because uh, uh, across Australia, a lot of mirrors point towards the RNET mirror. Um, we, as an example, um, as to where STN might take us, the, the RNET mirror is, it was historically running on a, a single big box in Brisbane. It's uh, since been moved into a more distributed content delivery network. And so we're interested to know as to uh, whether the network can do more intelligent things to allow delivery of things like this or our own cloud store product work better. Um, and, and that goes across the board. Um, many of you, I guess, would know that we're running an increasing number of tools across our network. This is a, a speed test one. Um, can can uh, changing the way a network work uh, make the network work faster. Um, that said, this is taken from a colleague of mine up in Brisbane where he's able to get 10 gig to the desktop and, uh, and as you can see the speeds that he's getting are a little more excessive than your average home connection. That one, there was no Photoshop involved, it genuinely did say infinity. <laughs> um, okay, so enough background. Uh, why SDN? So I've, I've touched on it from our, our own context, uh, why we might be interested in a, in a, in a, in a very broad, forward-looking sense. Um, I thought I'd dive into that a, a little more closely now. Um, so if you go back to those days of 1993, um, Arnet ran a network, and I guess most service providers ran a network, but, but this is particularly evident in the research and education networking. Um, move forward, and the network is no longer uh, the full solution that our end users need. So the way we and many research indication network providers, as well as commercial providers, obviously, as well. We see that the network is only one building block. You need to be tying compute and storage to that. Um, high performance computing has known this for many years, for instance. Overlay that with software tools to be able to use that package and then talk to the users to, to explain and work with them on how to, how to use that full system. Um, and so SDN, Software Defined Networking, can potentially um, bring enormous advantages in, in tying together those underlying technical tools of this, um, the network, the compute and storage, and that overlay of, of software tools to, to allow that. Um, I guess that's the, the blue sky uh, perspective of this. Uh, what could this uh, enable? And, and certainly there are many different ways of achieving advantages in this area. Software defined networking or software defined X um, has enormous amount of potential in this. Um, 
and its potential across the board. Uh, if I sort of build up the, the picture of, of why you might want to be involved in, in software-defined whatever, I guess there, there are two main drivers here. One is, can you do things at a lower cost? Um, and can you do things better, so cheaper or better? Um, and SDN provides uh, potential in, in both these areas. Um, the lower cost area, uh, and, and again, this is talking about SDN in the context of, uh, of open flow and, and that sort of um, grassroots software-defined networking. The, the idea is that you take what was traditionally a router running uh, data plane forwarding of traffic and, and the control plane intelligent management of the traffic and you separate them apart, uh, enabling you to run cheaper commodity silicon for the, for the fast forwarding and make use of virtualization and, and cheap x86 based compute power for the control plane. So uh, if, if you do it properly, it should cost less. Um, on, the, on the doing it better side of things, I guess the, this is where it gets a bit more nebulous and it depends on your application, but uh, the idea of, of software defined networking in this context is having a, a single view of your network, which, which provides you a lot of power when it comes to doing things with that network. So choosing paths, uh, choosing uh, destinations, how you treat traffic, um, adding more flexibility than simply having individual, individual or independent devices coming up with a, a federated view of the network. Um, and again, as I said before, if, if you have a single view of the network, then potentially you can hook that into your view of your storage or of your compute uh, and gain a single view of the, of the whole system. Um, now, this can have applications in all sorts of different sectors um, and, and areas of networking. So in the data center and cloud providers, obviously we've seen a huge amount of progress in this. Um, Google has been doing uh, open flow based or, or software defined networking for, for many years now. In fact, within their data centers and more recently out into their web, they've been using SDN. Um, features to, to be able to drive utilization of their links up to above 90%, which um, historically is, uh, is very difficult to achieve in networking in the networking space. Of course, on the right-hand side, expanding a data center a little bit broader and adding some features, it starts to look a lot like a, a campus, and, and there's been some great work done on that. RMIT, for instance, here in Melbourne, um, has, has done an enormous amount of work with HP on pushing uh, OpenFlow out into a campus type environment. There's been a lot less work done in the ISP or, or telco space for various reasons. Um, now, there are, and this is where buzzwords start to, to rain down around us. And, and this is where I guess um, if, you're, if you're trying to do any reading about SDN or, or to inform yourself about it, um, it becomes complicated. I, I think give it a couple of years and, and we won't talk about SDN anymore. We'll talk about different flavors of it. So for instance, NFV or network feature virtualization. That's a notion of taking, and uh, for a telco who would typically be running network connections, uh, customer premise devices, maybe a managed firewall solution, a load balancer. The idea is to, to turn each of those functions into something simply running on your on your virtualized machines within your data center. And that way you can feed customer flows through one to another to another um, without needing dedicated boxes and so on. So that, that's one very particular area of SDN. Um, if we look at something different, uh, policy versus CLI, that's going back to the RMIT example, what they wanted to do was, was stop running switches uh, across their network that you need to, as a traditional network engineer, connect to using the command line, configure VLANs, configure routing and so on. They wanted to have a single entry point where they configure policy for their users and that underneath that, or the back end of that, the, the system would then uh, push that out into each of the switches and routers. So no longer are you, you configure switches by a command line, you're, you're determining policy on a network-wide or a system-wide basis, and, and that's abstracted from the configuration of the network. So you can see there's, there are a range of, uh, of elements that, um, that SDN could be instantiated as. And I guess the, the benefits are both user-facing and administrator-facing, and again, those are two very different worlds. What drives me as the operator of a network is very different to even my colleagues who are pushing out uh, customer services for, for our users to be able to, to to make use of. Um, and so, taking all of this into account, there are clearly enormous areas of, of uh, research and development to be done. Um, as I said before, within the data center, there's been a lot of work done within the campus, a certain amount, and within the ISP, or service provider world, 
um, relatively little compared to those other two areas. Um, and so um, uh, I come to, to what Arnett is focusing on at the moment and, and where that came from. So, um, so part of our role as a research education network is to make available tools for our users and for our research community to be able to make use of. Um, this is something that uh, a commercial telco typically would not be able to do. Um, you know, our, our network has to be rock solid and we certainly endeavor for it to be uh, a production grade rock solid network, but we also want to make available um, capabilities on that network um, for, for our users to be able to experiment and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, some time ago, uh, Vijay Savaraman, who I think was going to be on this call, I haven't seen if he's connected yet, but a um, uh, very dynamic guy from the University of New South Wales, um, and myself and Craig Russell, uh, an engineer from CSIRO, uh, got into conversations around uh, how Arnet could work uh, with the research community to, to support and drive uh, research in the software-defined networking area. Um, VJ pulled together um, some uh, an application to the ARC for a LEAF grant and was successful and uh, as part of that um, managed to get together a, a group of a total 10 uh, institutions from around the country um, to be involved. So nine universities, the CSIRO, and then ourselves as a, a supporting partner. Partner, and and the intention of this was to build an SDN test bed. Um, now that's got two rings to it, or two layers to it, really. The uh, the inner um, part of that is the is on its own SDN test bed. So we've um, deployed currently two switches in Sydney and Melbourne. You can see on that diagram, and we're in the process of adding two more, one in Perth. And one in Seattle, and uh, and these are Novi Flow switches. So the actual model is a Novi switch 1132 in each of those four cases, um, and they're OpenFlow enabled switches. So in parallel with them, we've deployed a server running virtual machines in both Sydney and Melbourne, and so that uh, those four switches are configured up to talk up to a um, uh, the controller, and they appear as a single distributed router. Um, this is another view of the of the same thing. So you can see we've got our, our own backbone, the, the one that I showed before, extending across Australia and out to the United States and Singapore, and overlaid on top of it in a type of sandbox environment, we've got our own SDN test bed. Um, and then uh, VJ at UNSW, uh, Craig at CSIRO, and then research groups, of whom several I see are represented on this call. Um, then uh, as part of that ARC-funded grant, We'll be placing a, a bunch of SDN research equipment, servers, switches, and whatnot into a rack at that institution and connecting back via the RNET network uh, to one of the switches on uh, on our testbed. Um, and this will enable them to, to see each other across the testbed network to run experiments through uh, through the different domains or autonomous systems making up the testbed um, and ultimately uh, develop and, and discover new things, and pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. Um, if I dive in a, in a little bit more detail to, to what that looks like on the inside, so um, you can see in this previous diagram there are our four switches uh, with a couple of servers in the middle. That, uh, that starts to look a little bit like this. So the, the STM network down the bottom you could consider to be the four switches running on our network. Um, up above it, uh, those two columns of blue, orange, and red, you can consider them to be, uh, on the left, uh, a bunch of VMs in Sydney, and on the right, a bunch of VMs in Melbourne. Um, there's a, an OpenFlow controller running ONOS, which is a, 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 um, an OpenFlow controller developed by OnLab in the United States, a group that came from Princeton or Stanford. Um, and they've got an application called SDNIP, which uh, allows multiple switches to be turned into one distributed IP router. And then finally, a, uh, a VM running Quagga, which is talking BGP. Um, and then around the outside of that SD network down the bottom, you can see external networks. And you can consider those to be those nine or 10 institutions around Australia who are um, configured up. In fact, if you were to drill down inside them, they'll be configured up very similarly to, to that main diagram there. But, um, uh, but initially, at least, the, our central SDN testbed will simply talk BGP to those external networks. So it, it at one level leverages the way the internet works today. Very simple, very uh, un well understood 
protocols whilst allowing you to, to drill down inside a domain and, uh, and develop uh, completely freely inside. I'll talk a little bit later about, uh, about where we're hoping to go to with that. Um, I guess to, to, to give you a little more insight into how this works, so um, we set up BGP sessions between, so initially at least, you install the switches and, and plug them into the OpenFlow controller, turn all that on, and you've got a system that actually is able to, to forward packets. Um, set up BGP sessions out to those external uh, UNSW, CSIRO, Swinburne, and so on. Um, those BGP routing updates get pulled into the, the VM running Quagga, which installs those via routes into the SDNIP uh, application, and then that gets pushed out via ONOS into our switches um, and, and therefore simulates one big distributed router. Right, so uh, I'll just pause very quickly for a moment there before I go on uh, any further. Just to see if any of you have any questions, feel free to hit the Q&A button uh, and fire a question to me. When you write a question, it appears on my screen. Uh, it doesn't appear generally. So only once I've answered um, and, uh, and hit answer, then it'll get pushed out to the rest of the group. So feel free to, to fire any questions at this point if you want. I did see that VJ Severaman from UNSW is tuned in and listening. Thanks, VJ. <laughs> All right, if there are no questions, I'll, uh, I'll plow on ahead then. So uh, we've put in place this infrastructure. And I should have said, so at this point, we've, we've completed the rollout of the, the two Sydney and Melbourne switches. They're up and working. We've got uh, virtual machines running the controller, the SDN IP application, and the BGP route server. And that's working as well. So at the moment, we've got a, a distributed uh, infrastructure. Um, we've connected UNSW hanging off the side of that. The CSIRO is hanging off the side of that as well. And I've got a test set up here in the Melbourne office of, of Arnett, which is talking to it as well. So we do genuinely have a, a distributed uh, test bed up and running right now. We've got a uh, uh, the two remaining switches uh, currently um, in the process of being shipped, one to Seattle, which has already arrived and will be installed in the course of October, and a second one, uh, sorry, a fourth one, which will go into Perth um, sometime by the end of September, I'm hoping. So we should have a, a, an international sized um, network uh, ready to go uh, over the next month or so. Um, I'll just do a quick sidebar there and answer a couple of questions. So John Mann, John Mann has asked, IPv4 only? Um, John Mann, for those of you who don't know, is from Monash University, which is one of our heaviest IPv6 users, and is therefore well positioned for the future. The answer to you, John, is right now, yep, it's uh, only IPv4, but that's more a limitation of the SCNIP application. Um, there's, as with everything OpenFlow related, there's nothing to stop us actually writing uh, support for IPv6, but for the minute we thought, let's, let's get this up and running, um, and we can add features later. Um, Matthew Smee asks, will this webinar be available for download? The answer is yep. Uh, at the end or after the webinar, Warren, our host, will send a link to all of the attendees with, with uh, the, a link to where you can watch it uh, later. Um, right, so we've, uh, we've deployed the, the core of the, uh, of the testbed and we've started connecting universities and over the rest of the year we'll be connecting the remaining eight or nine institutions um, and there's a, a full list uh, somewhere. I think it's included in this presentation so you'll be able to check that out later. Um, and I guess the, the next step then, and this is the bit that, that with Vijay and Craig we're driving to tick it off at the moment, is, um, is running interesting research and tests across that testbed. Um, one of the first ones uh, which was run on the precursor to this testbed was um, instead of using Novi flow switches, which are the ones that are currently in this testbed, we had a pair of Corsa switches, a really interesting um, manufacturer uh, from Canada who are running 100 gig capable uh, open flow data planes. And so, but essentially they work the same way. We had a Corsa switch in Melbourne running an ONOS controller, another Corsa switch in the United States connected to the ESnet network with whom we peer 
in uh, LA, and it was running a different open flow controller, Ryu, that makes no difference. I guess what we were trying to, to understand here was, does this work in something vaguely production-like? So we're able to, the guys were able to, between ESNet and the CSIRO in, in Sydney, exchange 15,000 routes across an international link, um, which was more just to, to demonstrate that, that this works rather than uh, rather than, than it's capable of pushing 10 or 100 gig of traffic. It was, um, it's more just to show that this is more than a toy, I suppose. Um, and so that was uh, a, a successful demonstration of, of how to interoperate a, a range of different things. Um, moving forward, uh, there are a range of, of research projects which have been planned and will hopefully bear fruit over the course of this year. So, um, uh, across the, the different participants of the SDN test pit as they currently stand, um, there are a range of different ideas uh, that, that the researchers are looking at. So an example of one is, um, and this is of interest to us as a, a service provider forming part of the global internet, um, one of the issues today with the internet as such is um, uh, BGP does a lot of good things. One of the things that it doesn't do particularly well is allow you to remotely have control over where your traffic is going. So we advertise our routes to the internet, we listen to advertisements from the internet. You can, you can guide your traffic via paths uh, more or less by pre-pending your autonomous system in BGP advertisements or uh, using local preference and other methods to, to on, on routes that you receive. But um, for the most part, it's uh, the further away a destination is, the less control you have over, over the path that that takes. It will be nice to be able to gain some more control of that if possible. So an example here is if I'm AS1 and I'm sending traffic to AS4, call that, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Europe, then the path is going to take, so my traffic is going to take a certain path. It'll go maybe to the United States, it'll go up to Canada, it'll go across to Europe. There we go. Now, what if, for whatever reason, for, for latency reasons or quality reasons or cost reasons or uh, um, uh, there are a multitude of reasons. What if I wanted to take a different path? Well, uh, it could be that, um, and this is one of the areas of research that, that some of the guys at UNSW are looking at, um, the exchange points along the path, what if they offered a, an API so that I can connect to them and, and influence the path and becomes a paid service? Uh, as to how this works is, is another question, obviously. Uh, you know, BGP and the internet is complex enough as it is without allowing users to determine which way their traffic goes. But it's, um, it's certainly something that, that I could imagine would be very useful. We're often getting calls in from, from for example, um, users of our network that are using a cloud-based service out of Singapore, and they're seeing that the path that they're currently taking through a given ISP, you're seeing packet loss, and they say, Arnett, can you push my traffic to a different path? Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, particularly for the return paths. So a capability like this would be really interesting for service providers and, uh, and internet exchange providers also. Just an idea. Um, I guess what that uh, brings into, uh, into context then is the notion of Intra versus inter-domain SGN. So up till now, um, almost all of the work within software-defined networking has been focused on intra-domain, that is to say uh, within the data center or within the campus or certainly within the organization. So Google, for instance, that's an entity and they have full control over all of their devices so they can, they can run uh, versions of software, they can run controllers, they can make devices talk to each other. Um, they've got full control over their network. Now, uh, how does this work if you start talking uh, between domains? Um, this is the, the way that that's been addressed to date uh, on the internet at least has been via BGP. So the standardized way of autonomous systems talking to each other is via BGP. And as I say, we exchange routes, we exchange various uh, capabilities using BGP. Um, some of them work just fine and are determinative. Uh, others uh, you can try to influence, but it's not entirely 100%. Um, there's been some work done on, on extending uh, MPLS-based VPN services uh, between domains. There's been some work done in the R&D world of, uh, of extending light paths or layer two services across domains. Um, but, but SDN uh, opens up a, a range of possibilities when it comes to this. Again, it opens up as many complexities as it offers features um, because uh, now you're enabling other organizations to have control 
over a part of or over your network, which, uh, which is a complex um, aspect to, to address in many different ways, but obviously a rich area of research. So you can imagine on the diagram here, um, within that UNSW test bed, so the rack full of equipment, no problems with them uh, doing SDN related work within that. Um, but once you start moving across the, the SDN test bed to another organization, um, how much control do you give? Um, what features or what API do you open up to allow uh, another organization or another entity to influence your network? Um, so the testbed is intended to, to focus initially on, on inter-domain SDN, which is an area which hasn't really had a lot of attention until now. Um, and expanding on that, if you remember that diagram very early showing the red dotted lines and the, and the NRENs around the world, well, a number of them are working on their own uh, SDN testbeds because uh, Australia has got a certain amount of activity, but, um, but other countries around the world are equally interested in, uh, in developing this. So, um, Internet2, which is on its equivalent to a certain extent within the United States, is running a, a very similar testbed to, to our own and they're, they're keen to peer with us, um, which would mean that not only then could UNSW run tests to Swinburne across the testbed, but they could run tests to MIT or to Stanford or to Princeton across the testbed as well. Um, so very much opens up the notion of, of true inter-domain inter SDN. Um, likewise, RIANs, uh, our New Zealand cousins, uh, are very active in this area, as are ESNet, the Energy Science Network in the States, and Géant in Europe is, is running testbed as a service. It's even more, ex uh, more developed than, uh, than we are in that area. So uh, through the international connectivity of, of RNET, we're looking to, to peer internationally and, uh, and extend the reach even more um, with the hope of, of enabling collaborations on an international level. Um, bringing it back to, to a different area, so I've talked there about uh, connectivity across domains, between domains. If you bring it back within a domain, one of the big areas that we see um, is security versus performance. So um, a number of, of campuses now, and this is not just in Australia, but around the world are seeing um, that the different types of traffic flowing in and out of the campus um, are not necessarily coherent with each other. So a researcher at the University of Melbourne trying to suck down 10 gigabits per second of physics data from the LHC um, doesn't want that to go through the campus firewall and the campus security people don't want it to go through the firewall either because it knocks uh, the day-to-day -day operation of the university off the air. So there are various mechanisms at the moment, just, this is just taking an example of, of separating that traffic um, while still securing it at a high performance level. Um, SDN offers up various possibilities. So there's an architecture called Science DMZ developed by ESNet in the United States, um, which, which is designed to, to pull research data or data intensive uh, sources and sinks out from behind campus firewalls. Um, open flow in SDN uh, enables the possibility of, of dynamically um, moving those flows out from behind the firewall. So Brocade, for instance, has done some work uh, on, on uh, an open flow app to, to move, to identify elephant flows, as they're called, and move them out to bypass the firewall while still putting in place the security um, the rules and so on necessary to, to, to keep the, the campus security people comfortable. And this has many, many applications. For us, for instance, we have two links to Singapore. One of them is more direct, um, but uh, is occasionally congested. The other one is a longer path, which goes from Sydney through Guam and Hong Kong to Singapore. It tends to have plenty of bandwidth, but the latency is increased. So for us to have the capability to, to dynamically identify that, uh, that it's... Um, traffic that, that needs shorter latency um, but is low bandwidth, we can switch it this way, or bigger flows with, uh, with high bandwidth requirements but that don't care about latency, then switch them the other day. To me, that can genuinely help us make better use of our international links, which are very costly, and give better performance to the end user. So, so security versus performance is a, a really interesting area also. Um, I forgot to, to say that was to demonstrate the, the notion of dynamically switching around a firewall. So we're almost at the end. Looking forward, where are we going? So I've talked about the, uh, the nine universities in the CSIRO who are currently part of uh, VJ's LEAF-funded bid, uh, and we're in the process of connecting all of that. 
all of those institutions. As I say, it's fairly simple. Each of them has a rack of gear, a couple of open flow switches, a bunch of, of server hardware um, to be able to run up some virtualized equipment and connect into this test bed. Um, any of you at other universities, if you're researchers or ITS uh, staff, um, and, and you see a, a desire or you have a desire to, to play in the SDN or the open flow space, I'm keen to hear from you because we can absolutely connect more universities around the country. And uh, as with everything to do with the network, the, the more uh, connections and the more interconnections there are, the greater the value almost exponentially. So um, we, we're keen to hear from you if you'd like to be connected. Um, and we're keen to encourage and to help you uh, build collaborations. Now that may be between universities uh, or between an Australian university and uh, an international counterpart or even between uh, commercial organisations and yourself. So if, if, for instance, you are a researcher in OpenFlow and you've been talking with a, a cloud provider or with a, an exchange point provider um, and want to do some work with them, then this could be an opportunity to, to have some real-life examples. Um, and more importantly, I guess, run, run interesting tests across this network and generate some meaningful research and, and, uh, and get A, papers, and B, results. I've got a, a list of things that I'd like to know if OpenFlow can make the world better for me. So I'm interested in results. I'm sure those of you who are researchers are uh, interested in, in papers, and those of you in IT uh, departments are, are probably interested in both, uh, both supporting your researchers as well as understanding whether SDN or OpenFlow can make your network work better. Um, and moving forward again, um, uh, our, our aim over the course of this year is to be connecting those 10 institutions and any others who want to and get some, some results out the door. But over the course of next year and, uh, and following years, the intention is to, to see uh, what worked, what didn't work, um, add some complexity. So for example, right now the test bed is set up as a distributed router, therefore to go from CSIRO to UNSW means going through a central entity. We'll probably break that into, into multiple central entities or, or add uh, diverse connections. So it's possible to actually choose different paths or control different paths differently, uh, manage and monitor the different parts of the network independently. So, um, so I guess we're trying to move towards simulating the, the real life network internet global internet as, as much as possible. And overall, the drive uh, is, to, is to build a community and, and, uh, and share understanding of, of what this is all about um, and, and see what works, what doesn't work, and so on. Um, a couple of links for you as I get close to the end. Uh, as part of, the, um, of building a community in Australia and New Zealand, uh, a number of us have created um, a website and, and a mailing list called ANZ SDN. You're welcome to, to connect into that. There are various meetup uh, activities which are advertised through that. There's an SDN meetup in particular um, with activities in Sydney and Melbourne thus far and probably more moving forward. Um, for the testbed itself, there's a, a Google uh, site which uh, VJ and his team have created. So um, you can get more information there. Uh, as I say, this, um, these slides will be available later, so you can you don't have to be furiously copying them down with the pen right now. Um, and uh, myself, VJ from UNSW, and Craig Russell from CSIRO are, are keen to hear from you as well if you're interested in connecting to or feeding ideas into this testbed. Um, I guess if, if you don't have the, the, the personal bandwidth or cycles available right now to, to be working on this stuff, I'm to hear as our BJ and the other researchers of, of ideas of uh, things to test that you may have. All right, that is it from me. Now, Warren has got a couple of questions in the form of a poll, which I think he's going to send out to you, and I'd love to, um, to have you answer those questions. Very, uh, in a sense, we're also testing a new functionality of this, uh, this webinar software, so, um, so bear with us on that. Um, otherwise, uh, if anybody has any questions, please fire away at this stage, type them in, and, uh, and, and I'll answer them as, as we go along. I should have said thanks very much to all of you for, uh, for taking the time to, to dial into this webinar, by the way. There are a number of you connected there. 
really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen in. Um, and uh, we're always, always keen on, on hearing ideas for future webinars and or workshops and whatnot that Arnett could, uh, could run, which might be of interest to you. All I'm getting is, thanks, David. I appreciate that. If there aren't any questions, maybe I'll hand back to Warren then at this stage. Thanks to, thanks to all of you. Thanks, David. Um, I'll let the poll run until we close. Um, I'd also like to thank um, all the attendees as well for uh, coming on to our webinar. Um, feel free to contact us if you need more information about SDN. And um, also, if you do have a topic that you're interested in sharing to the research and education sector, please um, feel free to email us on zoom at rnet.edu.au. That's zoom at rnet.edu.au. We'd like to, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to host that for you. I'll just end the polling now. And thank you for those who responded. I'll just quickly share the results. And as David mentioned earlier, I'll be um, sending the recording URL to all the registered participants. Thank you and have a great day.